If you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to open again to Mark chapter 1. We're, uh, we're, we're spending our time here during Advent and uh, up through Christmas uh, in the first eight verses. <clears throat> and uh, we'll, we'll read those again in a few moments. But, uh, but this is, uh, we aren't going to spend this much time in every part of Mark going forward, but this is a really, really important uh, introduction to the book. And hopefully you're seeing just how much uh, is there. <clears throat> As I was thinking about this morning, I thought uh, of the book Peace Child, and maybe some of you have read it at some point, or there was a movie, I believe, that was done based on the book. Maybe you remember it. And, and in the book, Don Richardson, who uh, he and his wife were missionaries, uh, he writes about bringing the gospel to the Sawi people. And if you know the story, you know that the Sawis were an isolated, tri uh, isolated tribe, excuse me, of Stone Age headhunting cannibals. Get this, Stone Age headhunting cannibals living on the island of Papua New Guinea, or the island of New Guinea, excuse me. One of the Richardson's first attempts at sharing the gospel with the Sawi completely backfired. And it backfired for a very simple reason. In traditional Sawi culture, treachery was one of the highest ideals that they held. In fact, you might even say it was perhaps the highest ideal. And so guess what happens when you tell the gospel to people who value treachery? Judas, the traitor, comes off as the hero. And of course, that is not at all what, what Don and Carol Richardson were looking for. What broke the impasse was a legend from Sawi history, the legend of the peace child. And that legend gave the Richardsons the hook, the opening they needed to help people understand who Jesus really is. The story is a wonderful reminder of a number of things, including the fact that God has placed these hooks, He has placed these openings in surprising places. And that He often uses things that are already known to people as a means to bring the gospel to them. Richardson calls them redemptive analogies, and they are all over the place. I learned this last week that in a traditional Chinese language, in the written language, there's another one of these redemptive analogies, and it comes in the character for righteousness. And the character for righteousness in, <clears throat> in traditional Chinese writing is a combination of two other characters. One is the character for lamb, and the other is the character for I or me. And the character for the lamb sits above the character for I or me. So righteousness in traditional Chinese writing is the lamb over me. Pretty amazing. We shouldn't be surprised. We see it time and time again. We even see it in the Scripture. We see Jesus often using familiar things to make a point about who He was or who God was or, or what the kingdom was like or about. And as we come to talking about John's baptism this morning, let me suggest, believe it or not, that baptism actually falls into that category of a redemptive analogy. Maybe not quite so much for us today, but certainly, certainly in John's day and in Jesus' day. We often think, I suspect, of baptism as kind of a uniquely Christian practice. And depending on our background, we tend to define it pretty pretty narrowly, but there's a lot more to it than I think we often appreciate. And, uh, and as we come to John's baptism, and that's what's in front of us today, 
I hope that we will get to appreciate that more. And we're actually going to come back to John's baptism on, on the 9th um, because, uh, because we'll be looking that day at Jesus' baptism. And the two, uh, the two messages this week and on the 9th actually will, will correlate nicely. But if you have your Bibles open, let's, uh, let's look at Mark 1, uh, verses 1 through 8 again. Mark writes, The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the peoples of Jerusalem went out to him and confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey and this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. As we think about uh, John's baptism specifically today, we need to start by recognizing that baptism at that time was not, was not something new. John didn't invent it. It was not new when Jesus commanded it in Matthew 28. It was not new as John practiced it along the banks of the Jordan River in these days before Jesus' public ministry began. For example, if you were a Gentile convert to Judaism at the time, you would have been baptized. Male converts were circumcised, but all converts to Judaism male or female, were baptized in part as a symbol of the break with their old life and their entry into Judaism. Now, we don't know exactly when this practice began. Some folks have connected it with the the healing of Naaman in uh, 2 Kings 5. We really aren't sure. But any convert to Judaism in those days would have been baptized. In the Qumran community, we touched on this before, we believe that John was part of that community by the Dead Sea. In that community, baptism was used as a sign of separation from what was perceived or seen as the the corruption of the temple worship at the time. So for Jews, baptism was not anything new or revolutionary per se. Same thing was true among non-Jews. In the Greco-Roman world, particularly among Roman military people, baptism was part of the initiation into what were called mystery religions. And the mystery religions were basically secret societies that, uh, that often were connected to military service. And baptism, a form of baptism, was part of their entry into one of those societies. And then, if we go beyond the Roman world, if we go up to Scandinavia, ancient pagan Scandinavia, there again we find baptism being practiced. In that culture, it was part of welcoming a newborn into a household. And if you know anything of the the cultural history at that time, when a child was born, the father would decide if the child would live or if it would be allowed to die. And if the decision was to allow the child to live, it would have water poured over it and it would be given a name. So, like that peace child of Sawi culture, the written character for righteousness in traditional Chinese script Baptism is, I think, very much one of those redemptive analogies. It's something that God had already placed in many cultures as a means of making a connection to the gospel. So, as John was baptizing, he was not necessarily doing anything new. 
What he was doing, though, what he was doing was repurposing baptize, baptism. Excuse me. He was reframing it. He was giving it a, a new and unique significance. Now, just to be clear, and we'll be touching on this again in a few weeks, John's baptism was not Christian baptism. I'll also say just a little bit more about that toward the, toward the end. John's baptism was not Christian baptism, but it was significant. Mark calls it a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now remember, Jewish baptism, as I said a few moments ago, Jewish baptism was for Gentile converts. John's baptism was for the Jews themselves and for more than just the members of his own community. It was more than symbolic. It was more than a ritual. It fell at least in, broad, in a broad sense under this, under this umbrella of preparation that we've been looking at, this preparation for God breaking into human history in a way that he never had before and he never has since. But it wasn't about all the things we talked about a few weeks ago of God arranging the, the circumstances of Jesus' arrival. It was about preparing hearts. And specifically, it was about preparing the hearts of God's own people. It was about humility and contrition and confession and repentance. When somebody came to John to be baptized, they were making a statement. They were making a statement about themselves. They were making a statement about their need for God's grace, for forgiveness. They were making a statement about their desire to embrace that and to submit to God. Now, the call to repentance wasn't new. It was part of that long prophetic tradition that we, that we talked about last week, which I think makes the quotation itself in verses 2 and 3 even more significant. I mentioned last week that that what John cites specifically as, as being from Isaiah was actually a combination of, of, of things from Isaiah chapter 40 and Malachi chapter 3 with echoes of Exodus 23. You may recall last week we talked about that Exodus, or excuse me, not Exodus, Isaiah 40 was about giving hope. About, about restoration Malachi 3, though, was very, very different. Malachi 3, kind of like the, the Malachi chapter 2, before it was not about hope. It was about warning. God addressing the priests of Malachi's day who had failed who had frankly abdicated their responsibility as priests, but also had abused the office of priest. And because of that, God said he was going to send a messenger, and that messenger would purify the temple and temple worship. In that quote, that Mark gives. There is hope, but there's also warning. There's promise, and there's also a call for correction. As I think more and more about 
verses 2 and 3 here in Mark chapter 1. I can't help but wonder if it isn't another one of those sort of subtle hints that we find throughout Scripture at different points. And I think that for a couple of reasons. I can't help but think that it at least sets up if only by implication one of the one of the themes that runs throughout the gospel and, and frankly runs throughout Jesus' ministry, and that is the conflict with the corrupt Jewish leaders of Jesus' own day. And I also can't help, again, thinking that perhaps it's even a little bit of foreshadowing of Jesus cleansing the temple not once but twice. Because that's what Malachi 3 says is going to happen. God is going to cleanse. Leave those subtleties aside. John himself was not very subtle. John had a habit for being in your face. And of course, that eventually led to his own death. But his message was clear. His message was absolutely clear that the Messiah is coming and you better be ready. And if you want to see the Messiah, you had better be willing to take stock, to repent, to turn away from your own sin and in that to submit to God. Bring a little closer to ourselves and to our own season of preparation here. Let me suggest that, that John's baptism, when we think about it and we think about its significance, it will challenge us to reflect. It will challenge us to reflect on the state of our own lives. It will challenge us to, to reflect on our own willingness to let go of things that are displeasing to God and contrary to His purposes and, and to more fully submit to Him. Sadly, we know that in Jesus' own day and in John's own day, that was something that many of God's own people were simply either unwilling or unable to do. I'm not sure how many of you know this. I know some of you know this, but others may not, that our own Dave Wall is a published author. How many of you knew that? Yeah, is Dave here? I don't see him. Not trying to put him on the spot, but anyway, yeah, Dave is a published author, and and in our men's uh, groups on Mondays and Wednesdays this fall, we've been going through his book, which focuses on victorious living, and uh, you know, as only God could arrange it, this last week, our focus was actually on how do we respond to, how do we deal with our own sin. What do we do with it? Now, Dave outlines six, uh, and I want to be clear about this, six wrong responses to sin. Uh, I'm not going to give you all six. I'm going to kind of boil it down and paraphrase into three. If you want all six, you're going to have to buy Dave's book and, and get them for yourself. He did not pay me to plug his book, by the way. But let me give you, let me give you three common but wrong responses to our own sin that even followers of Jesus will latch on to. One is avoidance. And, and avoidance is simply, it could, it could be doing something akin to what Adam and Eve did in the garden. You know, they hid from God, so they didn't have to deal with him. At least they thought they didn't have to deal with him. Or it could be hiding from other people or situations which, which remind us of the fact that there is sin there. So we will do something to, to avoid dealing with it. A second way that we might 
uh, that we might respond to our own sin wrongly again is denial. And by denial, I mean that we will either convince ourselves that it really isn't a problem, or we will convince ourselves, well, it's a little bit of a problem, but it's not really that big, it's not that serious. You know, we might even go to the point where we will somehow justify it. It's like, well, you know, I know under some circumstances that would have been wrong, but, but in this instance, it's really good. Third way that we can respond to our own sin is what I'm going to call balancing. And by that, I mean, you know, the balance of scales. And we can fall into the trap of thinking, well, you know, the good things I do, the things that please God, they're, they outweigh the bad things. And so, on balance, I should be okay with God. We do that. Every one of those three, and any and every variation of them, is a dead end. And I do mean dead. Romans 1 reminds us that all have sinned, and that doesn't mean everybody else. It means us. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us, all of us come up short of the mark. That's a hard thing for us to come to grips with. It was a hard thing for people in Jesus' own day. It was a hard thing for, for the Jews to come to grips with, especially as we see oftentimes the, the Jewish leaders. And because they had a hard time coming to grips with that, or they refused to come to grips with that fact, they often responded to John similarly to the way they responded to Jesus. They refused to see him for who he was. And they failed to grasp the truth of 1 John 1, 8, where John says that if we, and again that's us, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. The problem didn't end with people in Jesus' day. It didn't end with, with John's readers. It's alive and well. And if we think about the significance of, John's, of, the, of, of John the Baptist, not John the Apostle, not to confuse our Johns, if we think about the significance of John's baptism, I think we have to say that it will challenge us to take stock ourselves and to reflect on, on our own lives and our own need for forgiveness. And that reflection will challenge us to do something else. It will challenge us at times to repent. You know, it's one thing to recognize that we are sinners in some kind of vague, general way. It's one thing to recognize that we're sinners. It's another thing to actually take the steps to deal with that. It's kind of like it's one thing to recognize or to acknowledge that you're a smoker, but then not do what you need to do to, to quit smoking. Go back 
for a moment to the fact that John's baptism was a baptism of repentance and that it was a baptism of repentance for Jews, not Gentiles, not pagans, but God's own people. When I think about that, I think back to the Old Testament, I think back to Second Chronicles 7. Second Chronicles 7, 14. And it's a passage that I have often heard people just like us, followers of Jesus, I have often heard them use it, but I am convinced often using it wrongly. Here's what God says. He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Here's where I think we can often go wrong with it. We think it's about somebody else. We think it's about people who aren't followers of Jesus. We think particularly of of people who might be hostile to the gospel or whom we perceive as, as enemies of the gospel or people who are simply indifferent to it. We forget We forget that that word is a word to God's own people. It wasn't to the Gentiles. It wasn't to the pagans. It was to God's own people. And that means us. Now, in John's day, there certainly were those folks who did not see a need to repent, who did not see themselves as in standing in need of of forgiveness. But there were others who did. There were others who did, and we see that in in the response of of many people coming to to John to be baptized. Now it says here, the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Well, probably a little bit of an exaggeration. (laughs) But it points to the fact that there were those who heard John's message, who heard about his preaching, who heard about what he was doing in that southern Jordan Valley and recognized that that in anticipation of Messiah's coming, that they needed to repent. Think back once more to 1 John. Who's John writing to there? Again, he's writing to to God's people. He's writing to us. He's writing to followers of Jesus. And he says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. I don't know about you, that cuts pretty close to home. That's the bad news. There's good news though too. And the good news as he goes on, he says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That too, thankfully, comes pretty close to home if we let it. Because recognizing that the challenge is there for us, but so is the promise and so is the hope promise of forgiveness just like the challenge to honestly look at our lives it's part of the work that God needs to do and wants to do not just at Christmas time or at, during Lent but, but every day every day so on this fourth Sunday of Advent, as we come toward the end of this season of anticipation and preparation, here's my bottom line question. Are we ready for Jesus to come? 
Are we ready for Jesus to come? I said earlier that, that John's baptism was not Christian baptism. Again, we'll pick that up from a different angle in, in three weeks. But, but for now, let me just remind us that Christian baptism is actually a lot bigger than what Mark writes about here. It goes deeper. New Testament has more than a half dozen different images or ideas that it connects with Christian baptism, washing, rebirth, deliverance from evil powers, death and resurrection, uh, being welcomed into the, the fellowship of the church, of being owned by God, of being in a covenant relationship with God. All of those all of those need to be part of our understanding of what it means to be baptized as followers of Jesus. But you know, our, our ability to experience all of those does tie to what John's baptism was about. Our own willingness to humbly acknowledge our sin, to turn away from it, to reject it. Because that is the only proper response to sin. It's the only one that's actually going to work and it's the only one that's actually worth anything. So as we anticipate the celebration of Jesus' birth at the end of the week, the question still stands, are we ready for Jesus to come? Or putting it maybe a little more bluntly, are we ready to meet Jesus? The challenge of Isaiah 40 is just as much for us as it was for the Jews of John's day. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. So on this last Sunday of Advent, and I realize this probably seems a little bit odd for Christmas time, but I think it's important. On this last Sunday of Advent, as we continue to prepare for the celebration of Jesus' birth, I'm going to ask us to do three things over the next few days. One is that I'm going to ask that we allow God to show us the places where, where we may need to repent. Things in our lives that we need to reject or let go of. In today's note page, if you've looked at it, you'll see that there's actually a passage from Colossians 3 that can help us do that. Second thing I'm going to ask us to do is to acknowledge our own sin. But to do it in a way that will allow us to experience what, what the Apostle John wrote about and what, Jesus, or what John's baptism was about. It wasn't just about repentance, it was also about forgiveness. So acknowledge our sin, but also with the knowledge that, that when we agree with God about what's wrong, He does forgive. And He wipes the slate clean. And third, thinking back maybe just a little bit to Second Chronicles, to recognize that our humble submission before God. And in that humble submission, the taking on of Christ-likeness for ourselves. Paul says that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that, purpose or result, take your pick, we might become the righteousness of God, that our humble submission, our willingness to reflect and to repent where we need to do that, that's going to impact people who don't know Jesus much more. Much more than the things that they often see in us or they perceive in us. 
make accusations and arguments and anger. John the Baptist said that there was one greater than him who was coming. One who would, who would baptize not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is coming. He is coming. Are we ready?